As his story became known, it emerged that he had once been a religious teacher and a leader of his community. He had been 37 years old when he was captured in what is now Senegal. In an Arabic account of his life that he would later write, he explained that in freedom, he had loved to read his Quran, but in slavery, he had been converted to Christianity. His only access to the faith in which he lived more than half his life was now his memory. He was not alone in this. An estimated 20 to 25 percent of the enslaved men and women brought to this country were Muslims when they arrived. Across the South, plantations owners made it a point to add Muslims to their labor force, relying on their experience in the cultivation of indigo and rice. Muslim names and religious titles appear in slave inventories and death records. You may have heard last year when the governor of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal, warned about a coming Muslim invasion. Well, there are Muslims in Louisiana even before the Louisiana Purchase. The best known Muslim to pass through the port of New Orleans, for example, was a man named Abdul Rahman Ibrahim Ibn Sori, who was a prince in his homeland and whose plight drew wide attention in his, during his life. As one newspaper account noted, he had read the Bible and admired its precepts, but added, his principal objection was that Christians did not follow them. <laughs> As it happens, the first Muslim enslaved in North America, whose individual story is known, lived not far from where I do now in Annapolis, Maryland. In the earliest accounts, he was a man named Joe Ben Solomon. The story of his enslavement is a reminder that in history, we should always be suspect of clear villains and victims. When he was captured in the west coast of Africa in 1730, he had actually been in the process of selling another man into slavery. He was betrayed by the slave merchant, and while negotiating his price, he was actually captured and sold into slavery himself. He traveled across the ocean and was sold at the slave harbor, at the slave market in Annapolis, Maryland, made most famous um, through the story of, told by Alex Haley of his, of his descendant, I'm sorry, of his ancestor, Kunta Kente, who was also sold in Annapolis. Then he was put to work across the Chesapeake Bay on, on a small island called Kent, where he tried to escape again. When he was recaptured, an Annapolis judge visited him in jail and interviewed him extensively. The judge seemed astonished to discover that slaves come, came from a civilization as fully developed as his own. The story of Islam in early America, however, is not only one of individuals isolated in the way these two men were. Many, of, many slaves sought to create their communities, and where they were able to, they succeeded. One of my roles right now um, is that I'm curating an exhibit for the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And for this exhibit, one of the truly fascinating documents we found was written in the early 19th century on, on an island off the coast of Georgia called Sapello Island, where because of its isolation, a slave community was allowed to live and practice Islam under the leadership of a teacher who wrote an, Is an Islamic legal text in Arabic that continues to be owned by University of Georgia, and they've made it available for our exhibit. So if you happen to be in Washington a year from this summer, please drop by and you'll see this truly fascinating document from American history. Well, a clue to what happened to these early and forgotten Muslims can be found in the words of a missionary traveling across the South whose mission was to preach to slaves and convert them. Many enslaved Muslims, he noted in the 1830s, have found ways to, quote, accommodate Islam to the new beliefs that were being imposed upon them. He wrote, God, say they, is Allah, and Jesus Christ is Muhammad. The religion is the same, but different countries have different names. This missionary considered this to be evidence of Muslims' inability to recognize the importance of religious truths, but in fact, to me, it proves exactly the opposite. They understood that their faith was important enough that they should listen for it everywhere, even in a country so distant from, from the places where they had heard the call to prayer, even in a nation where only a non-Muslim like Thomas Jefferson was able to own a copy of the Quran. What it meant to be a Muslim in America at that time was likely beyond Jefferson's interest or comprehension. But nonetheless, the text sacred to all those uncounted thousands of enslaved 
was among his books, moving with the others from Virginia to Washington. It's the great tragedy, but also the opportunity of history that is only from the distance of centuries that we can see the true significance of that one book among the nearly 7,000. Only now can we know that it meant that the same words written by a fugitive slave on a jailhouse wall were on their way then to the Library of Congress. They were already a part of the American experience. They then became a kind of time capsule, waiting for a fate that was all, er all but eradicated in the United States to return. A similar set of connections might be drawn out from another book that was trucked up to Washington with Jefferson's library. This was a book called A New Pantheon, A History of the Heathen Gods. This book was for the most part about Greek and Roman mythology, but it also concerned itself with the Indi influence of Indian religious ideas on the classical age. Now, did Jefferson have any idea that these, quote, heathen gods even then were changing the shape of his country? Maybe not, but as his books moved north, some Americans were beginning to come to that understanding. While well, Massachusetts gave us book burners like Representative Cyrus King, at the same time there lived near Boston a woman of roughly the same age as both King and Omar ibn Said. They were all born within a couple years of the American Revolution, but one with a vastly different American religious experience. Her name was Mary Moody Emerson. She could trace her family deep into Puritan New England, and even claimed that she had been carried as an infant across the conquered battlefield. By, eight, by 1815, she was in her late 30s and unmarried by choice. By all accounts, she valued her independence above all else and did not suffer fools. As one admirer noted of her at the time, her blue eyes flashed like steel and stabbed like swords. She was expert in the look that demolishes. <laughs> in her later years, uh, she was known to wear a long black veil around town as if she didn't trust her family to dress her pop properly for the grave when the time came. Uh, when death finally did come in 1863, a Boston newspaper noted, she was thought to have the power of saying more disagreeable things in a half hour than any person living. <laughs> so this was a prototypical American eccentric, and she was also, uh, many of her contemporaries said, an undeniable genius. In her youth, she had been formed by the same kind of books found in Jefferson's library, works ranging from the poet of the Enlightenment, John Milton, to the preacher of the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, and from the classical philosophy of Plato to the classical liberalism of John Locke, and of course, she read her Bible. All of this made Mary Moody Emerson receptive to an unlikely meeting that she had a few years later while she was making a religious retreat at a nearby parsonage. It was there that she met a mysterious figure whom she refers to in her diary only as our stranger. This was a man who had recently arrived from India and who was invited to give a discourse on heathen gods as well as on the relationship of Hindu ideas with Christianity. Such discourses, by the way, on, on um, the relationship of, of Hinduism and Hindu ideas to Western thought were much more common in, in the early American period than they are now. In fact, in, during my research for the book, I came across a wonderful account of Thomas Jeff I'm sorry, of George Washington attending a poetry reading um, dedicated to the Hindu god of love in May of 1787. It's hard to imagine any of our current candidates openly attending <laughs> such an event. Well, during the course of the Hindu talk heard by Mary Emerson, our stranger presented his audience with images of the Hindu god Vishnu in various forms. He is shown with a whale's tail, uh, with the bared teeth of a tiger, with the shell of a tortoise, and with the tusks of a boar. In other images, he's represented as Krishna or as Buddha. Something in these images apparently touched Mary Emerson deeply. Her faith as a Christian was not shaken, on the contrary, she saw in this diversity of belief a complement to her own. She recognized in these Hindu images elements of classical mythology that had been part of her well-rounded education. But more than this, the stories of Vishnu presented, presented aspects of God that she counted among her own beliefs. Given her prickly temperament, she was not close to many people, but she did have a nephew 
who was newly graduated from Harvard at the time, who she had taken under her wing as a confidant and protege. Following the stranger's lecture on Hindu mythology, she excitedly wrote a letter to her nephew. She wrote, my dear Waldo, I have been fortunate this week to find a visitor here from India, well versed in its literature and theology. He showed to us some fine representations of the incarnation of Vishnu. At bottom of the histories and the incarnation is the doctrine of the universal presence and agency of the one God, she wrote. Our stranger had made a gift to her of several of these Vishnu images, and she sent these to her nephew. It was a single small gesture, but it turned out to be one that played a large part in the transformation of American literature. His Mary, Mary Emerson's nephew, uh, Waldo, was Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was the founder of the Transcendentalist Movement and among the earliest men of letters in the United States to take an interest in that part of the world that was then just broadly defined as the East. Genius, though may, many of her contemporaries claim Mary Emerson, Emerson to be, we likely know her name now only because of her connection to this great man in the making. In this, I think she joins uncountable other talented women who were not allowed, either by family or social constraints, to meet their potential. Yet in Mary's case, we might find solace in the possibility that we know Ralph Waldo's name only because of the inspiration that she had offered him. As he later said, if Aunt Mary finds anything is dear or sacred to you, she instantly flings broken crockery at it. <laughs> <laughs> she was, in other words, the stone against which Ralph Waldo Emerson sharpened the edge of his mind. Now, we often discuss religion in terms of communities and denominations, but ideas also move from person to person. A letter from an aunt to her nephew results years later in Emerson lending his newly acquired copy of the Bhagavad Gita to Henry David Thoreau, who in turn takes it with him to a little cabin in the woods near a pond where he writes the words, the pure Walden water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. Even a writer like Herman Melville, who was scathingly critical of Emerson and Thoreau, and Thoreau, he drank from these same waters, from that original source. Aunt Mary wrote to Waldo of the Hindu god Vishnu, and sure enough, Vishnu later turns up with a starring role in Moby Dick. The chase at the heart of the great American novel is not merely after an image of God or death, but what Melville alludes to at least a dozen times as, quote, the Hindu whale, an incarnation of Vishnu. It may seem like a shaky connection until you read in Melville's diary an account of hearing a lecture given by Emerson during his writing, during Melville's writing of Moby Dick. He says that he considers Emerson a man who dives deep to find meaning. Melville wrote, any fish can swim near the surface, but it takes a great whale to go down five miles or more. In this, he connected Emerson directly not only to the whale he was writing about at the time, but to Vishnu, whom he describes in the very same terms in a story recounted in Moby Dick, in which the Hindu god d dives to the depths to find the Vedas, the holiest books of Hinduism, and deliver them to the world. So what we see here is the sharing of religious ideas within one family that changed American literature and prepared the ground for the arrival of actual Hindus when they arrived in the country decades later. Like Jefferson's Quran, the heathen gods that traveled north from Monticello to Washington may have been far removed from the lives for whom many gods were already a religious reality. But through such reading, Jefferson at least became open to the idea. After all, he makes a point of citing a multiplicity of gods in his most famous defense of religious pluralism. As he wrote in his one published book in his lifetime, Notes on the State of Virginia, it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. He didn't stop there. He continued to make the case that difference of opinion is advantageous in religion. Is uniformity even attainable, he asked. Let us reflect that the world is inhabited by a thousand millions of people, that these profess probably a thousand different systems of religion, that ours is but one of a thousand. 
Not only is this an argument that the majority religious tradition might have something to learn from those on the margins of the dominant faith, it's an argument that when seen globally, all religions are marginal. Each on its own is one in a thousand. Yet joined together in a community of faiths, in a belief and unbelief, each can somehow become part of something bigger, ennobled through moments of interaction and transformation. This, to me, is the real meaning and significance of all those books coming down from one hilltop in Virginia, heading toward another in Washington. The spiritual diversity within them represented only the beginning of the multi-religious nation this country would become. And it's also a reminder to think more critically about the religious labels we use. After all, the church-going owner of that library full of infidel ideas was himself a Christian of a sort, as was the would-be book burner representative Cyrus King, as was that Hindu-influenced daughter of Puritans, Mary Moody Emerson, and by the end of his life, the enslaved Muslim teacher Omar ibn Sayyid. That four such different American experiences could fit in the same religious box should be enough that we never hear that term Christian nation the same way again. And this isn't just a matter of history. Congress today, for example, is only slightly less religiously uniform than it was than the Congress that debated the pros and cons of burning Jefferson's library. A study last year found that 92% of the members of the 114th Congress belong to churches. Yet many of our current lawmakers, like the nation they represent, may be more spiritually diverse than any mere accounting can describe. For example, among the hundreds of members of Congress sworn into office with their hands on a Bible in recent years was a Buddhist, Georgia Representative Hank Johnson, who explained that he used the Christian text as a nod to, tra tra to tradition rather than a statement of his own belief. Another example is the, the then mayor of Newark, New Jersey, who is now the senator from New, um, from New Jersey, Cory Booker. When he announced his interest in seeking higher office in 2012, this Baptist from New Jersey did so beside a stack of books that would have been right at home in Monticello, including a New Testament, a Hebrew Bible, and a Bhagavad Gita. And in 2007, the first Muslim member of Congress, Representative Keith Ellison of Minnesota, when he took his oath of office, he used the same copy of the Quran that was brought from Monticello to Washington 192 years before. This was perhaps the inevitable end of a journey that I like to think represents the true place of belief in all its diversity in American life. Now, because Jefferson's library moved from one of the grandest homes in Virginia to the center of government, some may see this as only a lofty pursuit. They might suppose that religion is just full of ethereal ideas and it's separate because of that from other aspects of life. But in fact, religious freedom and religious diversity, they take hard work. Just think of all those books and the effort it took to move them, the many hands it took to pack and load them, and the 10 wagons required for that long trek north. Think of those books bumping and jostling like the citizens of this country often do, in constant conflict and contradiction over subjects that they hold most dear, often searching in vain for smooth paths of agreement, veering off course, <coughs> getting stuck in the mud, needing a push in the, in the right direction every now and then. Maybe that's an image of who we are and can be as a nation. Thousands of ideas moving over a hundred miles of difficult terrain. But somehow, we hope, we're always moving along the same road. Thank you.